I'm Bill Hirschman. I'm the editor, founder, and chief critic for Florida Theater on Stage. I'm also on the executive committee of the American Theater Critics Association, as well as the chairman of its new plays committee. And I'm Gordon Cox. I'm a reporter and editor at Variety. So, <laughs> great panel. Uh, so I've been asked to do the impossible, which is to moderate seven panelists who are super articulate uh, in essentially now under an hour to talk about the future of theater criticism. Um, since this actually cannot be done, uh, we are um, going to uh, try a format that I've used for those of you who I, I always have asked to moderate panels, never to sit on them, and I've tried this before and it's worked pretty well. So what we're going to do is, um, it's kind of, I'm a big sports fan, it's out of ESPN, uh, if you watch Pardon the Interruption or Around the Horn, um, we are going to do a kind of Around the Horn, uh, so, because I wanted everyone's intelligence to be a part of the conversation, I am going to be, um, giving people an allotted time to respond to the questions, and I'm actually going to time them with my stopwatch. If um, the landlord in Boston calls me and tells me I can have the apartment, uh, I may take that call. But um, otherwise, uh, I will be timing them. Uh, they've been really good sports about this. It can kind of cramp the style, but I think it'll get the conversation going. So um, our goal is to not just, we're, we're going to do a little bit of like the past of criticism very briefly, the present, and the future. So, um, and I'm going to try to leave a solid 15 minutes for questions from both this audience and the New Play uh, TV audience. So, huh. all right, so uh, before diving uh, into the future, um, let's talk a little bit about the current state of theater criticism. Uh, Chloe Veltman on uh, HowlRound yesterday, uh, uh, who's a theater critic in um, San Francisco, uh, wrote a lovely little blog post, um, and she says, uh, the thing is that criticism, when practiced diligently, is a much higher calling than commentary. Anyone can comment on something. But to construct an engaging, deeply felt, educational, and entertaining response to a work of art is an art form in itself. And unless I spend the necessary time digesting the work, reading around it, and thinking about it before putting my thoughts into the public domain, then it's not criticism, it's merely commentary. Um, and so I guess my first question uh, to you all uh, is um, to think about in this world where everybody is commenting on everything, um, where does criticism fit and does it still matter in that context? Uh, and if, um, Bill, you're ready to roll, I think. And so this is going to be a 90-second response. Um, sorry. I know, it's so brutal. All right. Take, take it away, Bill. <laughs> do, I have, do I have 140 characters here? Um, the short version, if there is such a thing, and which I've just used up another 10 seconds, is that uh, criticism is, continues to be vital uh, because for the exact reason you mentioned. There is a difference between commentary and criticism. Uh, my website was created as professional, vetted, edited arts journalism, as opposed to the very many wonderful sites out there that have a dialogue between simply patrons. Uh, my goal is to give out truth as objectively as subjective people can do it. Uh, and my sense is that I've been trained, I've spent a lot of time learning how to do what I do, and I bring something to it that simply somebody who happens to be Twittering at this exact moment may or may not bring to the party. Uh, Great, thanks. that was only a minute, or just so you know. I wanted to go on for hours. Go ahead, Gordon. Uh, I, I feel like criticism has to matter in that if commentary is kind of the first uh, the first step toward creating or thinking about, uh, thinking critically about something, then if a piece of theater really grabs you, then I feel like criticism is the first place you turn to, um, to if you want to learn and think more about it. And it's also the thing that can inspire further curiosity or encourage you to look at things from different perspectives or encourage deeper thought and et cetera, et cetera. It can sort of, it is not only the place that people, I think, first think of when they kind of discover a passion for theater and they want to learn more about it, but it's also the thing that can sort of stoke the fires of that passion. So uh, I feel like if theater is in fact going to endure, um, then criticism does matter and it is important to that. And uh, now the challenge is sort of finding a space for it. Deep, yeah. Um, I wanted to expand a little bit on what Bill said about 
criticism and commentary, and also what Chloe wrote. And I'm, I was in the arts journalism program at Syracuse University. I graduated last year, so I'm really young. But my, my advisor always told us that she doesn't want us to be re reviewers, she wants us to be critics. And the difference is a reviewer can just say whether or not you know, he or she liked this piece of work, whereas a critic has has a knowledge to contextualize a piece of work, the social, political, you know, repercussions of that piece of work, and also the how it stands up next to the playwright's other works, and and I feel like that's a it, it's a good way of recording this this ephemeral piece of theater that may never be seen again, or it will be remounted for another 10, 20 years, and so it's a good way of keeping record. Great, thank you. You guys are really good at this. I'm so impressed. Um, <laughs> not easy to do. Sasha, why don't you, you know, you uh, jump in next. Uh, I, I'm tempted to cede my time for the future rather than the past. But since we're in the past, one of the interesting things I think is, you know, this generation of critics um, like Eric Bentley and, and Robert Brustein and, and uh, Harold Klerman and that kind of generation of critic really we are in this transitional stage of passing things down. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a broken period. And in that broken period, partly because of the internet, I think, uh, and, and having to do sort of speed dating things like this, um, when your mind works really fast, you tend to say and see what you expect to tend to see and to say. And so developing critical thought is really hard to do right now. What I've noticed with students is that students tend to dance back dance and paint back painting and do theater back to theater. That criticism as we know it may be changing and that in this world of the internet where suddenly you have diminishing numbers of critics at, in the traditional sense, you have a bigger wider me megaphone and a bigger space that maybe what we're looking at is something completely different and to be kind of open to this um, expression. On the other hand, I think the word is really important and that the, critics, the critic is there to uh, understand and interpret and extend the conversation of the word. Theater is about word and criticism is about metaphor. Um, good for 90 seconds. <laughs> Well, I, I guess I feel like the, the way that most of us tend to interact with criticism most often is in the consumer report style, um, uh, sh should I go see this kind of way. And, um, I'll, and while I am very interested in the, the more academic, after I've seen something going and, and filling in what I know and, and becoming um, more informed thing, I think that um, the, the state of that consumer report is something that I've been really obsessed with and trying to look at how those are written and how we as uh, patrons of the arts use them. And, um, and thinking about this difference between commentary and criticism, thinking of criticism as, as people have brought this up, as something that contextualizes. But contextualizes not something you've already seen, but contextualizes something you've never encountered before in a way that will make you hopefully want to go see it. And I think that that's the tremendous responsibility that critics working today have, especially when uh, working with, when, when responding to new work. That it, I really think it's a critic's responsibility, whether, to, whether it's thumbs up, thumbs down, how they like it or not, to also, I feel like we all have a responsibility to engage on something on the level of what is, what is, what is this artist trying to accomplish and what is the community of work in which this artist is working. And that I think that there's a, a tendency, at least in the critics that I've encountered in the communities in which I've mostly produced work, to, um, if, they, if they don't like that community of work, to, to dismiss it and not take it into account at all. And, and I always think of that as being someone who was um, you know, an art critic in, at the time of abstract expressionism, just really wishing someone would paint a flower and not taking into account that all of this other stuff was part of a huge body of work, both of artists and of, of uh, viewers, people going to see the work and, and participating in that, in, with it in that way. Um, I think if a critic doesn't acknowledge that, even if they don't like something, they're falling down on the job. Um, so I think good criticism is, is uh, it connects our work as theater makers to a larger conversation. 
um, because, and it educates our audience. Um, and, and we need criticism, not just commentary, because, because theater matters. And criticism um, is what explains how theater matters, how and why theater matters. Um, and good criticism makes this, uh, makes this case by discussing how uh, successfully or unsuccessfully um, theater engages with the world around it. Um, I think criticism is very different by locality uh, where it's based. And in Austin, Texas, we look for critics that can help our audiences understand how the Rudmex shows are in conversation with a contemporary performance happening elsewhere. So that's one of the ways in which we, we can benefit from really good, honest uh, criticism and not just commentary. And I think also uh, a, a critic is, is both, um, a criticism implies uh, focus and commitment. You know, a, a critic comes back again and again to the theater and focuses mostly on theater, whereas commentary, they may see a play one time and not see again a play for another, a whole another year. Um, and, and as a collaborative theater artist, we demand commitment and focus from our, our collaborators, and we uh, expect the same from, from critics. Um, I'm glad I went after you guys, because uh, this thing about, about collaborating with a critic I think is really important. Um, I'll just share an anecdote. Uh, earlier this week, uh, my company in Boston uh, opened a new play um, by a young writer, and it's a workshop production, and, and a little bit late in the game we found out that the playwright didn't really want reviewers to come, which is fine. Uh, it, it meant we had to scramble a little bit to figure out how we were going to communicate with our press who had already been invited. And we ended up finding a really good solution, which was um, I ended up writing a, a letter to, the, to our, our press contacts, um, really trying to explain like what this production was. What do we mean when we say workshop production or developmental <coughs> premiere rather than world premiere? Where did this place sit in context of its process so far? And what was happening right after our production? It's actually in another production already, another workshop production, and then after that, the playwright will end up sort of bringing it together in whatever the quote-unquote final version is before it gets changed. Um, and uh, and we, you know, I had this really great moment where um, the, the reviewer came, and uh, he ended up calling our AD up like three or four times on Monday before the review came out to double check to make sure he understood what we were talking about when we were saying workshop production and what we meant when we were asking our audiences to sort of receive the play as a piece in process. And when the review came out, I cried. And I never cry at reviews. I never, I never cry at reviews. Um, and I didn't cry because it was good. I actually, I cried because I felt like we were understood. And I felt like there had been a moment of collaboration with the critic who also was, he's new to theater criticism. and, and uh, there was, a, I think he had an effort to um, try and meet us halfway. And that was one of those moments I thought, yes, this is what criticism is for, because we ended up getting really good feedback that I can use with the playwright. Great. Good job, you guys. Um, thank you. I, you can see, I, like, I only like this format because everybody gets to talk, and I appreciate everybody getting um, it's such, so many great comments. Uh, just thinking about that commentary uh, criticism thing, you know, we, we may talk about this at the end, but when that when the whole Mike Daisy thing happened, the, the need to respond without thinking, you know, if you didn't have a response in 24 hours as a person who writes in the world of journalism, you were you had missed the boat. And I don't I don't know how people formulate thoughts that quickly. I find that an interesting, you know, it's interesting that pressure. And it, it, it leads me to this next question, and again, this is kind of the last question about the, you know, whatever the past is, but in that, uh, in, in the um, conversation that uh, Eric Bentley and Stanley Kaufman and, and Bob Brustein did a few years back uh, called Critic as Thinker, um, Eric Bentley said, you know, that the role of the Broadway critic was to do a consumer guide, and that, the, that it was a very particular role as a Broadway critic. You had to tell people who were coming into town whether they should spend their at that time it was $100, I think it's closer to $300 now, um, on their, um, you know, that Broadway ticket. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, I, I've been in Chicago the last few years and, and uh, you know, we have the star system, uh, four stars, you know, and, and if Chris Jones reviews it with four stars, um, it will sell the show up. It's a, it's a guarantee. And then in San Francisco they have that horrible first news dance. <laughs> um, and, um, and so I just wonder, you know, uh, where, what is the role of the consumer guy for the critic? And is that how criticism now is sort of making itself relevant? And um, maybe we... Um, Start, Sasha, you want to jump in on that one first? And this is, oh, this is, this is only a 60 second uh, response. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I just don't think there's any way a critic, a critic is not an advertiser. It's not, it's not somebody, it's not a person who is there. When people behave 
um, in the thumbs up, thumbs down kind of way, you tend to begin to know much more about what that so-called critic or reviewer, I would just call that person a reviewer, um, is thinking and who that person is rather than what the characters are thinking. And I just think it's, it's just reductive and, you know, it exists, but it is not a substitute. I mean, we all know that. I think what's interesting is to begin to start to think about, um, I brought this book here and I really highly recommend it. you all get it. It's called Counting New Beans and it's the intrinsic impact and the value of art, uh, uh, um, the pr production of um, uh, uh, Clayton Lord wrote a fabulous beginning to this. And I like to think that the critic can move between the marketing and the artistic staffs inside of organizations and that there is a place there kind of between, but not so simplistic as that. Great. Um, well, I, I think the, the consumer report question implies that there's a consumer and that we're all in agreement about who that is. <laughs> And I, and, I, and, I, and I find that more and more to not be true. And I feel like the, the best reviews that I've gotten are not necessarily the most positive reviews, but the ones that were able to, um, I think, uh, translate the work for audiences who might not necessarily be already interested in either the work that my company was doing or the uh, specific theater that it was being produced in, right? That we're, in a way, in the theater very tribal. And that um, I think some of the most exciting consumer report style reviewing or crit criticism is able to collaborate with both with the artists and with their audiences and that that means that there's some kind of agreement about what we're all doing what the critic slash reviewer is doing what the artists are up to and and who their intended hopeful hoped for audience is and um, I, I, I find myself wanting more and more conversation about that and not knowing how to have a conversation about um, who is our audience already, like who's going to come see our work anyway because they know they already want to, and who are those people out there who don't necessarily know about it because they're not, our circles don't intersect enough, and that I find that reviewing and criticism are forums where that overlap can happen. And that, that translation act that a critic can perform is, is really exciting when it really works. Yeah, I think that, you know, if we're looking for a consumer guide, that commentary suffices as a good consumer guide. And I think, um, you know, as things progress, I think that we'll see a, a probably a Rotten Tomatoes of the theater, an aggregate that can, you know, gather these things and give us a simple thumbs up and thumbs down. But I think, I think that, you know, criticism can do so much more than that and, and does so much more than just give us a thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, you know, we have to, I have to admit that as a self-producing theater company, we do look for great pull quotes to slap on a poster. I mean, that is something we want, but I think you can get an awesome pull quote from really good criticism, and, and hopefully a, a deeper and more meaningful pull quote. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, speaking to this idea of, of, of criticism, uh, you know, and working with critics as collaborators, I think it's hugely important in Austin where we had a community of, of, of critics that have been around since the inception of our company in, in 96. And so they have a really good context for our work and can bring a real depth to, to their criticism. And so when we do a musical, which we've never done before, they can put that in context and help make sense of that to our audience. Um, and, and the other thing that in Austin, um, they do such a good job of nurturing new work and understanding that, you know, some people getting together in a room and just experimenting and not, and not judging that, uh, but really uh, have been really able to foster uh, what Austin is, which is a, a community of, of people making their work. I don't want to jump the gun into the next question, which I know is coming, but um, uh, I have found, for, for me, I have found that I discover better criticism on blogs and more reviewing in print media. Um, that's just where I'm looking. Um, and even, even in something like the New York Times, where we're talking about these sort of like Broadway consumer reports, I'm way more, I almost never read that anymore. I almost always go straight to the Artsbeat blog, where there's sort of more thoughtful commentary and there's more context. 
And I think, you know, I teach, um, I teach dramatic uh, literature and dramaturgy and uh, theater writing at Boston University, and one of the things I try and do is train my kids from the time they're freshmen until they graduate to write in the form of a critical response whenever they're talking about a play, whether it's in print or in production, that, um, that immediately identifies what they, where they are meeting the piece. What is their own context? Like, what, what baggage do they bring? What are their expectations? And if they can learn to say that first, we can understand what their response is and how to, how to contextualize that. And to me, that's where a lot of the best um, criticism on the blogs comes in, because I feel like there's a deep bench of sort of a record in those blogs about people sort of questioning their own um, stance in relationship to the work they're seeing. And I, I, I prefer getting my criticism that way, but I also think our audiences don't necessarily do that. Um, Go ahead. I, yes, Gordon. Sure. Great. Yes, uh, um, I sort of think the consumer reports uh, angle on criticism is the thing that makes theater criticism relevant to the people who own newspapers right now. I think that's the only thing that keeps them around, as, as little as they are at this point. Um, but I also feel like that is also the thing that is being replaced by social networking. And there's a lot of Broadway research that says that critics don't sell as many tickets as they used to. And the thinking is that it's because audiences are finding out what to buy from their friends on Facebook or they're following Twitter feeds, and et cetera, et cetera. So if that's the role that is slowly being supplanted by the social networking, then I feel like um, we have to try and find a space for criticism doing all the things that we talked about, but I, I'm not convinced that it can be, I, I, you're gonna have a hard time, I think, convincing the people in newspapers that it's valuable enough to keep a staff on and have the space for and all that stuff. So I think that's the challenge moving forward. I, I think the answer is all of the above. I mean, I think there is a need for consumer, uh, consumer reporting in the sense that one of the first things when I'm going to New York is I, I want to know what should I see. And I don't mean, and I want to know what other people thought, and I want to know what other people thought that I think has some kind of insight and taste. Uh, that doesn't have to agree with me, but I'm not looking for what the 14-year-old fanboy thinks. I'm sorry, that's fine, but, and I think there's a place for that. But I think that the future of theater criticism, or to stay even with what I think criticism should be today, has five or six elements to it, of which one, and maybe at this point the most minor one, is the yay or nay. And uh, I think, again, I agree, context, telling people what it is they're going to go see. I'll try to do this in 15 seconds. But I have a famous story where one of the finest things I ever saw in regional theater was a production of Floyd Collins at a mainstream musical house. And the people who came didn't know what to expect. They thought they were coming to see Oklahoma. And they got, <laughs> and they got Porgy and Bess. They walked out in droves. And it was, a, it was one of the finest things I've seen in 50 some odd years of theater going. And it was because they didn't know what to expect. And one of the things that I believe criticism should do in addition to, did I have a good time? Did it do what the, 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 the creative people wanted it to do, whether I liked it or not, but whether it did what they wanted to do, is to help the consumer know what it is they're going to go see. So that, they're, what's the phrase, managing expectations. I think you have a heck of a lot less walk out, <coughs> even for people who aren't looking forward to that particular type of work, particularly for seasoned subscribers. They may not like that particular kind of work, but if they know what they're coming to see, and I think that's part of what a critic should do. Yes. I think being the last person it means that everyone just said what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to expand on the, uh, on, on the consumer guide, because it assumes, and well, it assumes that the readers already know what's going on in a theatrical landscape, but what if they don't? And that's the role of the critic is to either bring in new readers or or to or to help have towners, you know, figure figure out what they should go see. And also, I don't, I don't, for me, I don't see social media as supplanting that because it also assumes that you have people that you know who know a lot about theater. Which for me personally, I didn't grow up with theater, and I. And I just happened to be reading a lot of newspaper, newspaper reviews, and I realized, oh wait, I should go see that, because it sounds pretty good. And so it's a way to bring in new audiences, it's a way to retain, to retain old ones, and it's also a way of managing dialogue. And so criticism can have many facets, it's just, you, it's, 
just you need to, now we just need to figure out how to make money off of it going forward. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, uh, we'll solve that. Uh, and I, actually, though, I think that raises a really interesting question. It's kind of where we're headed now, which is um, to the sort of the current state of affairs, which I think is, um, uh, as, as Sasha points out, in, in a really interesting way, is that we're in a kind of broken, we don't know what we're quite doing, and it's all changing, and you know, where is that going to leave us? And, and it, it, um, uh, it's that question, I think it's the big question of amateur and professionals. You know, if everybody can chime in, what does that mean for the professional critic, and then what does that mean for the artists who are, you know, um, in trying to engage a community? It used to be obvious who the people were that you were engaging, and now that's so much less obvious. Um, you know, William Mammoth did a thing uh, recently, um, they did this Twitter experiment, and uh, the, the, um, the plan, I'm just reading from the, the, the article about it, but the plan was a call for applicants to join a tweet-up. Um, and so it was just random audience people joining a tweet-up, out of which uh, we would pick three participants. Uh, the experimental nature of this undertaking led us to limit the number of participants. Our three participants were invited to attend our first rehearsal of Civilization All You Can Eat, a technical rehearsal, and then the final dress. <coughs> participants were invited to tweet their thoughts and reactions to these events using the show's hashtag, Willie Civ. Um, uh, it was kind of a, it ended up being kind of a, you know, an interesting disaster for them, which they wrote about. Um, <laughs> one, one, partly in, because they forgot to tell the playwright they were going to do it. Uh, and, um, I, um, but I think that you know it, 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 it really uh, you know speaks to this question of you know just sort of you know audience coming in and being the people that talk about the show versus critics coming in for an advanced preview and being the people that talk about the show. So in this world where social networking and, and criticism are kind of all mixed up and audience um, uh, community uh, you know commentary and blogging is you know replacing you know the idea of the review and in Wooly's uh, situation. Uh, Artists and institutions are, you know, now able to create their own buzz about the work. I mean, actually, that even the debacle of it created kind of enormous amount of buzz around the show. Um, how does the how does the professional critic uh, enter into that particular uh, realm of, of reality? And because I think now we're getting at kind of the meat, I'm going to give you a whole two minutes um, to respond uh, to this one. So, um, Deborah, you want to jump in on that one? Well, that's a, you know. <coughs> All right. Um, I don't know if I'm the right to go first, but I think I'm going to say something contrary. Um, <laughs> which, which is that I, I love, I love, love, love uh, any opportunity to bring an audience into the process. And I, um, I think that's an extraordinarily important part of making theater vital and relevant in the 21st century. Um, and, and being transparent about that and also um, <laughs> Because I think, it, I think it's fun, and I think that audiences love it, and I love it, and I love that conversation. That said, I feel like that is on the spectrum of audience development, not on the spectrum of criticism. And I think that what that does, in a really wonderful way, is create um, more insiders. And this comes back to the question again about uh, when we're talking about criticism and reviewing, uh, whether it's a consumer report or whether it is a, a, a learning contextualizing uh, criticism. Um, who is, who is the audience or who is the consumer? And are we all on the same page about that? And, and when we start thinking about this Woolly experiment in the context of criticism, I think we're saying that what we want to do is create more insiders who get what we do, and that that's the only way our work can be understood. And I remain hopeful that my work can communicate both to people who know a lot about the collaborative processes in which it is written, and I also hope that the work will stand on its own for audiences who are not knowledgeable about that. And so what, so, so, I, so I don't think that one replaces the other. I think that uh, in order to keep, in, in order for theater to breathe and develop in the 21st century, I think we should be more transparent about our processes and we should create opportunities for audiences who are interested in participating in that way to be a part of the room, um, rather than treating it like a, a live movie that only exists as a final product. However, at the end of the day, there is that show that people come to, whether they're paying 10 or 20 or $150. And I think that that 90 minutes or three hours needs to stand on its own, even if you don't know how it was made. Um, well, I think the, the tweeting and things like that that is happening now, I think that these give the critics even more purchase. Like, I don't, I think that the critics can use these things. I don't think that they necessarily displace the work of the critic. Um, it gives them access to varied opinions and, and they can use these YouTube videos and 
and blog posts and things like that that theater companies are putting out um, to deepen their, their knowledge of the, of the piece. So I don't think that there's necessarily a displacement there. I mean, I think the, the landscape is, is definitely changing. Uh, Jill Dolan won the Nathan Award for Criticism this year. So it's the first time that a blog has won uh, this Critics Award. Um, but if, if, it's a, if it's a sign of changing times, I think it's a sign, uh, it's a good sign. Uh, Jill Dolan's blog, Feminist Spectator, is one of the best um, uh, sources of criticism out there. It's just brilliant. And one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that it's so insightful and passionate is that she has uh, an infinite number of words that she can work with. So she <laughs> often does uh, write very, very lengthy uh, reviews. Um, and, and, and it's because of this new technology that, that, that she's able to do that. Um, yeah, and so I, and so I think that yes, I think these things can can coexist. Um, you know, I, you know, plays written by playwrights, um, produced in conventional ways, don't uh, can coexist with um, new work uh, devised by ensembles in the same way that criticism can can live side by side with uh, consumers and, and tweets by audience. Um, they coexist, and they're and they're better for it. We're, we're better for off for having more. Although I do mourn the loss of jobs. I think we're seeing this this breakdown of, of work and leisure in our, in our society because of these new technologies. The fact that I carry my work email around with me all the time is always accessible. The fact that we're now doing the work of the cashier, checking ourselves at the, out at the grocery store, just these little ways that work is entering into our, into our leisure time. And so it is a loss of jobs, I think, um, as people uh, lose positions, um, like the movie critic at the Village Voice who recently left. So I, I, do, I do more than that. Um, so I, I have to take issue with the idea that, um, that you know, and I don't know that it's, that it's present up here, but that the, the internet is like some damning thing that, you know, that, oh no, criticism is dying, because the internet, I think Jill is a great example of how it's not true. Um, and I also don't think that Twitter and Facebook are just for 14-year-old fanboys, you know, and that I, I'll, for me, uh, I'm on Twitter, and I use it to have much larger grand scope conversations about the American theater than I ever had before I was on Twitter. And the reason is, is because I have reach out to people who otherwise I would not be able to speak to because of the hierarchical nature of all kinds of things. So like, for example, um, I'm really thankful that Peter Marks is on Twitter because he's a really interesting and thoughtful guy. And he has a lot of things to say that don't get into the, into the published uh, critiques that are in the newspaper. And he, you know, I find it really um, valuable to me as a person who makes theater to be able to like have that conversation with Peter Marks or with any of the other people who otherwise I don't have access to, whether it's artistic directors at large regional theaters or critics in other cities or critics in my own city, um, that otherwise there's not really, sometimes there's not a method by which you can reach those people with like your short 140 character, no stakes question. Um, one of the things that Twitter has done is that it's made it possible to have sort of more contact. And it gets back to my thing about how I think it's more important for us to collaborate with critics than to sort of create these divides. And um, I, I, guess, I guess I'm just really thrilled by the advent of social media because it has given me way more access points than I ever had before and it's enriched my life as an artist and it also means that I have more access to more kinds of criticism, which um, also makes my work better. Uh, so the more I get to talk to the critics, the better I think it is for everybody. Um, and that's something that I couldn't do before Twitter and Facebook, because otherwise it was sending an email to the newspaper and hoping that they got back to me and they didn't think I was trying to buy them off or some other thing. So, uh, so yeah, I guess that's that. Um, you want, or I'll, I'll come back to you and I'll go this way deep, because I don't want you to have to go more toward the end again. There in the last one, so. Oh, goody. Okay. Um, well, it's, well, I used to, I used to have this almost pathological hatred of Twitter just because I, 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 I I'm old fashioned by nature and I realized, I, I thought it was just like everything indicative of everything that was going wrong in the culture. <laughs> everything was just so fast paced and you need, today's news is yesterday's garbage and it won't be relevant a week from now and not much less to say a month. But, now I realize Twitter and Twitter and Facebook, it's just a great way to encourage interactions, both between critics and artists, crit artists and audiences, critics and audiences, and it just opens up more ways of more ways of having dialogue. Because before it used to be 
it used to be there was this iron curtain up in terms of theatrical, like what was going on behind the scenes. And now, like, and now, and now audiences are encouraged to come in, tell tell you what they think, and tell critics and journalists like us what they think about what the heck we're writing. Some most of most of them it's not very good, but. And so I, I find that it's it's a mixed blessing, and also now you can you can get information so quickly, and for and for journalists it, it allows us to get to be right in right in when when that news breaks because when the Mike Daisy thing broke I found out via Twitter, and then a, a thirty minutes later there was a, there was blog posts after blog posts that, that were being posted, and so it's it's just uh, it's, I feel like it's just indicative indicative of. The, this culture that's just moving faster, and either you keep up with it, or you fall behind and get run over. <laughs> wow. I came here spoiling for a fight. <laughs> In fact, it's really encouraging to hear what everyone said. Uh, I'm a dinosaur. I started with the uh, 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 doing criticism with the monks with the illuminated manuscripts. <laughs> but, I, like many of my generation, have embraced technology, and only a fool, meaning most of the uh, print publishers in the world, only fools don't recognize how you can take professional, vetted, edited arts journalism, which includes criticism, and not only put it on a cyber platform, and but do wonderful things that you couldn't do before as far as interactivity, being in contact with the people that you're communicating with. Only an idiot doesn't recognize what a wonderful tool the internet has been. What my hobby horse, again, being a traditional newspaper journalist, an investigative reporter, a former cop reporter, is that there is a difference between uninformed commentary or even informed commentary and experienced practice criticism and arts journalism. Uh, we probably won't get to, to the Mike Daisy thing, but there is a search for truth that both artists and journalists are looking for. But my truth has nothing to do with trying to sell tickets. Newspapers, yes. But tickets, no. And I don't care where the chips fall as long as it improves the society and the art form in an overall sense. And I've got a higher, I should say higher, that's not right. But I, I, I am adamant in making a differentiation between people who merely have commentary and people who are professional journalists and analysts. And that also includes academics who are writing reason criticism. And one last thing along those lines, one of the best things about the internet, is that I'm sure Gordon can tell you, everybody's space has shrunk. And the ability to make cogent, intelligent observations and analysis has evaporated, particularly in the regional publications and region. And the great thing about the internet is that I have the room not to go on forever because people on the internet don't want to read forever either. <laughs> but to go on and give cogent, intelligent, and I have space to do it. And as you can see, I can talk a heck of a lot longer than two minutes. <laughs> I'm not sure I have anything particular to add to this other than I feel like we've just answered the question, which was where is how is criticism finding space for itself? Yeah. It, it's doing it online with these blogs that don't have work counts and that don't aren't sort of subject to the editorial and budgetary whims of, uh, of uh, you know a newspaper. So I think that's where it all where it all lives now. Um, and yeah, let me just like, let me let Sasha finish up here and then uh, no, okay. And I I take umbrage at the, at, at the you know at, at the vilification of 14 year old fanboys because <laughs> <laughs> because that's where the kind of, that's where the conversation is heading sadly enough to say because those are the people who are really passionate about what they're writing about so much that they don't really care if they get paid get paid for they just want that opinion out there and that's the great thing about blogs it allows people that people who don't have that training to make an informed, well, to put their opinions out there. And it also gives, and it just, for me, any, any dialogue is good, no matter where it's coming from, either from a journalist or a blogger. And these days, newspapers have both, and that can only be a good thing. We're getting wound up. I like it. The umbrage is good. <laughs> let, let me clarify. I have, I have nothing wrong with a conversation. I believe in 
in, in the public arena and the discourse and the value of 14-year-old fanboys telling me that Les Miserables is the finest piece of dramatic literature ever created. But, and I mean it, I, I think that the overall discourse that the internet has made possible has definite value. It just isn't criticism. But it has great value in, for instance, critics having some idea what the heck is going on in the interaction between artists and audience. And I learn a great deal by, not from Twitter, but from other places that involve social interaction. So I'm not, I'm not dissing social interaction. I'm just making a really nasty, hard and fast differentiation between that and what we do. Sasha, you, you want to jump in on this one? No, do give me the next one. Well, I'll <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that was going to happen like this too. I, I, you know, I told you you can't have a conversation. It's, impo it's an impossible conversation. <laughs> We're barely going to just scratch the surface. Like I kind of want to just stop now and start talking. You know what I mean? For like the next for the next like six hours. I'm right? going to get up and dance. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I actually want to smoke that cigarette right now. <laughs> um, so no, don't no, not my cigarette. Um, so. Uh, questions. I want to do one last thing before we get there because we're, uh, like I said, we're not going to, we're not going to do this topic justice uh, in our 45 seconds of talking. But, um, but why don't we at least, uh, you know, talk for like if everybody did 30 to 45 seconds down the horn here, around the horn, uh, uh, about who's going to win the Louisville? No, I'm sorry. About, about, um, uh, about the, the, the kind of where you see it headed, and I think I'd love to, you know, if anybody can hit that topic. How do you make a living? Uh, at it uh, in that in this context. So if we could just kind of go that way, Sasha, could you jump in for sure, me? Sure, 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 sure. Uh, you know, so I, I mean, I'm in the business of, of teaching, and, and I you know have these students who come to my program at USC to learn how to be arts journalists and critics. And you know, I I have to, I ask this question of myself all the time: What the hell am I doing? <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm taking tuition from them for a job for what you know but you know he, he, you know one has to, to ask this and the thing is it come, it really comes down to this anybody and in our program we now take art artists because uh, people who are in the arts who love the arts I mean what we're really talking about is that seminal it's all in this book and it's a great book about impact and about memory and those experiences that you have where you want to tell someone else. And I happen to believe that critics are born, not made. I think critics are actually sort of thoroughbreds and that not everybody is a critic. They just aren't. It's a way of thinking and looking and seeing and expressing yourself and living your life. It is a very different kind of animal than a reporter, than a commentator, than, I mean, it's just different. <laughs> I, I think, like, the thing that's, what's, what's coming across now, and in terms of the money thing, it's all about experimentation, and that's what Engine 28 was about, and Engine 29 is about, and that's what I'm working on with my students in my classroom. We play around a lot. Now, what I've heard here is that everybody likes engagement, and if you look at the report from the Irvine Foundation, I mean, we are getting more and more and more so that the audience is increasingly engaged with the art form. And you think about the Greeks, and you think, well, okay, you know, they used to come, we come, we sit around just like this, only it was all men, and we watch, you know, Euripides, the men, and they would have a discussion about, well, should we take these refugees in or not afterwards, and then they'd go out and vote. What difference is that from what we can now do as journalists, which is to create, we frame the conversation. And we create the environment in which you can vote. That's bringing in the audiences. Critics and arts journalists have audiences too. And we serve our audience. And we're figuring out who our audience is. And we, you know, in that piece, because you guys all want critics. You want to hear. That feeling that you have of being understood and you cried, that is ex that's the kind of criticism that I hope to create and, and, and help others create. And it's that connection. And now, more than ever, I mean, we just went, in a, in a sense, through a dark period in which the critic had to be, quote, objective and held outside. <laughs> and now we can come in. 
And there are a variety, and everything is individual. Those individual critics in Austin and in Boston and in New York are different. And your relationship to them is individual and it's different. So it comes down, it really comes down to that sort of this one by one by one thing. And it's very personal. Uh, thank you. And Sasha had banked time. She asked me about the bank in the green room. It, honey. She asked me in the green room if she could bank time, and then she did it. So, um, <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, uh, so, so like a thirty second around the horn, and then questions. So, what was the question? so it's like future theater criticism, for God's sake, something like that. <laughs> um, well, I think based on what I what yeah, what I'm hearing is. Um, Right, it's a super encouraging thing about how the future of our criticism seems to be more about um, all of these different ways in which we are building a community between the people who are writing about what we do, what we do, and the people who come see it, and that those, also those lines are blurring. And I think that that's really extraordinary and really exciting, and it makes it, it the more and more I've engaged with that um, in the last couple of years, it's been more and more exciting to be a theater artist, and I felt more engaged and in control of the trajectory of my own career, because I do feel like the elephant in the room is that still, especially in some cities, that there are critics who, who do sort of hold sway in a way that can be career making or career breaking. And that that still, maybe that won't be true in, in another generation, but right now, in, in this moment, uh, that is still true. And so the challenge I, that I feel like I'm taking away from this is to embrace all this community building and also figure out how to get that out to the people who aren't going to Jill Dolan's blog, who, who aren't seeking out that community, because otherwise it's, it's still a community of insiders and I want to, I, I want to broaden the reach. Uh, I, I think that uh, funds need to be made available, uh, I think at a national level, uh, hopefully from uh, places like the Mellon and, and the NEA. And I think that hopefully arts writing uh, as artists, as theater artists, we need to recognize how important arts writing and criticism is to, uh, to the field uh, and, and advocate for that. And I think that, that regionals and festivals uh, hopefully will host um, conferences like the, uh, the Critics Conference at the O'Neill Center uh, that run concurrent with a festival uh, and can be a forum for critics to talk one another. I think one of the things that unfortunately goes away when we lose uh, newspapers is having an editor look at emerging writers um, criticism and and having a being mentors to those people so I can imagine you know online forums for people to mentor other people's writing and, and hopefully edit and hopefully there are actually funds available for that that people can apply for to to be a mentor to someone else's writing um, I think, so, uh, I know you skipped the question about how artists generate their own buzz, so I'm going to yeah. incorporate that here, yeah, which yeah. is that, right. um, you know, I think about something like, uh, like 2AM Tea Online, which is this amazing uh, conglomeration of theater artists and writers and um, people really just talking about the issues of the theater and talking about, uh, talking about plays and talking about lots of things, and that to me, it's both artists and critics together, I think. And um, stuff like that, I think, is where the future is headed. And, and it's about creating dialogue, right? And then there's things like Arts Fuse in Boston or New England Theater Geek, which also do this thing where it does provide the long form. And it also provides a place where you get the context of who those people are in relationship to each other. And that thing about it not being objective. There's like, I mean, I say this to my students all the time, there's no point in pretending that we can be objective about art. There just isn't. So we might as well just own our subjectivity and make that the material from which we write about what our thoughts are and how we are engaging that work. And that, to me, seems to be the most exciting place where criticism is going. All right, and I'm going to break out of the democratic state that we've been in um, to uh, um, take some questions, but you guys get to answer first. How about that? Uh, all right, because uh, otherwise we're going to give people no time to ask questions. Go ahead. Go, go. Just go. I mean, you're right. No, there's a reason. Because I think there's something there. What, what I am doing uh, is advertising supported. We do not know if this is going to work. But I will tell you that in eight months of operation, we have 13 ads on our website now. We charge uh, uh, dog meat. But we, the response from the theatrical community looking for another voice looking for an inexpensive advertising medium gives me some kind of hope that at some point this will not be simply uh, a drain, but in fact may possibly be a hint at an economic engine. We don't know that, but the signs are amazingly encouraging.
Garden. That's why I wanted to. And I'm going to persist with democracy deep in, the, in Garden, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, as someone who was a journalism student, Sasha, I'm just going. I'm pointing this out to you. In, in, they tell us don't be confident that you'll find a job within journalism because it's not just arts, arts journalism. It's, it cuts all across the board, and. So now, I feel like the future is, one, you have to be a really good writer, and you need to make your argument very cogently, and you need to relate both to the audience and to the people that you're writing about. And at, at the end of the bridge, still. And two, you need to have a really big online presence, and you need to bring the people in, because in journalism school, they tell you you have to brand yourself. You need this, people need to know, oh, this is, a, this is Deep Tran, this, this is someone that I trust. Hopefully one of these days, and, but, and that's how Ben Brantley. That's his brand. People know, but that when they read a re one of his reviews, they know it's coming from somewhere that's very knowledgeable and very well written. And and three, you need to just have enough followers that those the advertising revenue will pay itself off because that's because unless public publications start charging charging for a viewership, which hopefully is going to happen then that's how, we, that's how we're making money these days. And you need to bring people in to read your work, otherwise there is, it's just all silence, which is bad. Gordon, have the last word, please. Yeah. Uh, I, in my head, the future of the kind of criticism that we're talking about exists. Uh, I think has to, is gonna have to be funded by, you know, big foundation, nonprofits, foundations that have a lot of money towards supporting the arts or, um, maybe even like a nonprofit theater or a network of nonprofit theaters because they are the most invested and understand the usefulness of an investment of an engaged and growing and active and thoughtful audience. Um, so I just feel like that is the, I feel like that's going to be the way forward, at least of the options that I'm seeing right now. So we have like five minutes. I'm sorry, I tried to control the panel, but it's yeah. as best I could. Um, we, if you, you need a microphone to ask a question, there's a microphone back there. Um, and if we have any, on, I'll take one from Twitter too. But the microphone, is there a question? Who's got the, there's a question right back there. Where is he? Yeah, he's coming. Yes. Um, I, I don't need a mic. I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> go do it. I'd like the panel to comment on this recent trend of celebrity artists as Critics, uh, Stephen Sondheim eviscerating Porgy and Bess, uh, Kim Novak versus the artist. Um, how does that af affect your work? Does it affect your work? Uh, could you comment on that? Gord, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might have no thoughts on that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's a different thing, and I think that's not. I, I don't know that. I don't know that readers, for instance, sort of conflate the two. I mean, I think if they're it's sort of another version of the social networking version of the, the audience. The, the conversation is just growing and growing, and everyone has, the, has their voice, including Kim Novak, about you know, the soundtrack of the artist. So it's just another one of the voices that we can now hear in this sort of increasing cacophony. We would love it if Stephen saw that would come see our place. <laughs> they're having artists that they like and admire choose a play to go see and then the critic goes see the show with this artist and then they have a conversation about it and that's what runs in the Wall Street Journal is this conversation between the critic and the artist about this this third work and so I think that artists talking about other artists is, is awesome. Yeah. yeah they're doing this thing at the Fusebox Festival in Austin where they have artists impersonate the, the so they, the artist goes to see another artist's work and then they have a talk back where they act like they made the piece, and, and the audience asks them questions, and they act like they made the piece and talk back about what they did not make. Go ahead, Ben. Question. Hi. Um, so I'm, a, I'm here as a, as a journalist, but I guess I'm primarily a director, and I work on staff at uh, Off Off Broadway Performance Venue, and I guess I have always wondered why there are not more practitioners in 
arts journalism. Besides the obvious conflict of interest, I actually think it would be incredibly interesting to have either an eminent, you know, say, former artistic director with a you know, 40 year history in the theater to comment on the theater that he sees in his city, or a working practitioner commenting on other theater performances that's at the level that they work in. Um, one of the blogs I write for does have a mix of playwrights, actors, and directors actually writing about the scene that they're in, which I think is brave and, and scary a little bit. But, um, but gosh, I think it's it's missing, you know, and I think it's what makes criticism for me sometimes feel rarefied. What does an issue, what or something have to do with or know about the process that happened? Maybe I can lend a little light on things from lighting design to other stuff that uh, someone who has a straight writing background might not have ever had familiarity with. And I wonder what you guys think about that, and I don't mean to be dismissive of straight journalism or writing backgrounds, but um, I've always wondered why we don't have a sports type thing of like famous ex-sports players <laughs> sitting behind a desk, famous e economists comment on business, why, why can't famous and then theater people be allowed to comment on theater and writing more? Um, so, okay, I'm, I'm not a famous theater person, but I will say that uh, I train in criticism and dramaturgy, and I often have these urges that I um, sort of stifle every six months or so to sort of start uh, a place where I'm writing about the theater I'm seeing, but I don't do it because um, one of the reasons is is that I it hurts my heart sometimes to, to, uh, to be critical um, to people who I, I love and who, and I think that that is one of, I mean, I can't imagine that I'm alone in that. And so it's, it's I have a, actually have a constant little war inside about that exact question. Um, and I wish, I wish that I were braver, but uh, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> Here, you talk. <laughs> no, I, just, a, just a quick point of history. I, the New Yorker has always had, uh, John Larr uh, won a Tony. Um, Dorothy Parker wrote there, S.J. Perlman, Truman Capote, Tennessee Williams, they all wrote for the New Yorkers. There is a tradition of that. Yeah, and I don't think it's a question of being allowed to, because I think they, they're allowed to write as long as they're really good writers. I think it's also, can you remove yourself from this situation? This is someone that you might know who is a friend. Can you criticize them fairly? And if you can't, then that's, then you're, then it's, it, you, then you're useless to your, to your readers as a critic. I believe there's a Twitter question over there. Yeah, uh, G. Kirshner asked, what ideas do you have about reaching new audiences through criticism, and how do we educate, excite non-theater goers? <laughs> I have another one. Can you just say it again? Say it one more time. Yeah, um, uh, what ideas do you have about reaching new audiences through criticism, and how do we educate, excite non-theater goers? The, uh, the, the, Okay, Alan Brown has this thing about, um, he talks about anticipation. And he talks about how the experience, the impact, apparently the impact on your audiences, if you're a theater owner or playwright or any of this, um, the more an audience is anticipating something, so the more they know beforehand and the more they're given the opportunity to discuss it afterwards, which is kind of where I think journalism does come in, perhaps. Um, that, that uh, oh God, now I'm looking at you and I've completely lost the, the space, the question on this. But, uh, um, but there is an opportunity there, I think, with criticism, and, and also, I don't think criticism is, you, you keep referring it to sort of as this thumbs up, thumbs down sort of thing. I think it's the discussion and the conversation. And um, that there is an opportunity here actually inside of the theaters themselves. Can I, I was just going to say simply that what most of us that are critics are trying to do as far as reaching new audiences is obviously leveraging the internet. Uh, I use Facebook a great deal uh, and several people are using Twitter and then using that as word of mouth as the next step in the word of mouth chain to tell people that we're out here and what we're thinking. I think there's actually, um, as much as I love the social media, which I've just now gone on about for an hour, um, uh, I also think that we have a problem, which is that there are a lot of our portions of our audiences that are not using that at all. And so, how, and so maybe those people are actually more in touch with this consumer reports model. So how, is there a way, and I don't have an answer, is there a way to harness the consumer reports model and include other parts in that so that there's an audience who can, who can find other ways to get excited about things that don't mean they have to be on Twitter and Facebook, because a lot of people aren't. OK, 
Okay, it's 11.33 and there's like 15 hands up. Um, so I, I think I, I have to, um, we have to take it outside because there's a crew and there's a play and that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we don't have more time. Thank you very 